you enjoyed some of those goofy polls. Again, my name is Scott. I'm the marketing guy here at BP of Microsystems. And, and I'm Colin Harper. I'm the director of sales and product management. Yeah, so we're really excited that you guys were able to come. Uh, today we're going to be looking at our one of our newest uh, systems, the 3901 automated programming system that BPM launched last year in October. Yeah, the market has really responded favorably to the machine. You know, it's a price point at which we haven't had our full featured equipment in the past right. and had a lot of momentum with the with the product and uh, really happy to introduce the machine to a lot more folks as yeah. well. Yeah. So. Uh, what we're going to try to do in the next 30 minutes is just show off this machine. Uh, we're going to show a job changeover, I mean a real live job changeover. We're going to show how easy it is to operate. We're going to run a job. We're going to show something really cool called Whisper Teach. Now if you hadn't heard of Whisper Teach, I think you're going to really be interested in that. And if we got a little bit of time at the end, uh, and again we're going to try to get you out of here in 30 minutes, uh, we'll do some Q&A as well. So Colin, take it away and tell us about the 3901. Well, as you said, we launched the machine in uh, the fall of last year. A lot of market accept, uh, acceptance for the machine. And, you know, the, the machine really is a full-featured APS. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it comes standard with two programming sites. But, you know, pe people may consider, oh, is this an entry-level machine? It's really not. Right, it, right, right. All the features and functionality that are available on this machine are also available, uh, are the same ones that are available on the 3928 and the 4910. Okay. So even though standard, this machine includes two programming sites, stationary tray to stationary tray, you also have the ability to, la to add a laser marker, a tray stacker, tape okay. input, output, all the full, features you want. Full peripherals. Right. Awesome. Yeah, 1,088 devices per hour okay. is okay. the way this machine is rated. And just to put that in context, you know, one machine two sites, eight sockets, average programming time of 40 seconds, a lot of, a lot of numbers there. A, a manufacturer can expect to achieve a million devices per year on one shift. Wow, oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and so the beauty of this machine, it has all the same features and functionality. We try to make it easy to use. Right, Set up right. and change over. You know, Scott, the green light is really the most important thing. 1,088 might not sound like a lot compared to some of the, our other machines, mm -hmm. but really how quickly you're operating the machine, the downtime between jobs, and how often the green light is on. That okay. really is the, is the big difference between our machine and a lot of those other ones on the market. Well, I think one of the things we wanted to show was the job changeover. So, right. it, you know, the uh, real, you know, kind of real world, right now we've got this thing set up for one device. We want to change it over to another device. And I've got my, my phone over here to, to see how fast the sales guy can do it. Yeah, so I don't do this every day, but realistically, less than four minutes. So um, what I'm gonna do, again, we have a TSOP 48 package that's set up now. <laughs> okay. And we're gonna change it over to a BGA 153. All right. And uh, hopefully we, could, we can do that in less than four minutes, or I can. It's not a we, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens though. All right, we'll see what you got. Okay. I'm starting you now. Great, thanks Scott. So first thing I like to do is to remove the program devices from the machine. You can see we have a stationary tray installed. Okay. The next thing is to remove the pressure plate from site one. Okay. And the pressure plate from site two and then simply remove the socket cards. And I'll talk a little bit more about socket cards in a minute, but you can see that our design is such that it primarily, we have one socket per board. See, you're cheating, Scott, you're helping me. Oh, come on, everybody needs an assistant. Okay, well, thanks. Well, you know, one thing I'm noticing, Colin, is uh, you're just using your hands. There's no tools involved in the changeover? Yeah, ease of operation is the whole goal here. Okay. Uh, some of our competitors' machines, you do have to have tooling mm -hmm. to change over. It just takes a lot more time. So mm -hmm. I've removed the uh, TSOP 48 devices and now I'm going to repeat or reverse the process with the BGA 153. Okay. So A, B, C, and D. In fact, this is a good moment to stop and look at the socket card itself. I mentioned we have, in general, one socket per daughter card. There's a couple of advantages here. 
Number one, if you're doing first articles, you can buy one simple socket card instead of an entire large, more expensive gang board. Okay. Most of our competitors use one baseboard and they attach their uh, sockets to those gotcha. baseboards. And in this case, this type of socket has a mechanical connection okay. so that as they wear and all sockets wear out over time, oh, oh. the customer can simply replace the socket. <clears throat> the other thing is fault tolerance by having individual socket boards. Um, you know, we, we basically, if one does go bad, unlike maybe a gang card where you have a, a trace and if you're sharing circuits, you, you might have a problem where you have to replace the entire uh, socket board. Gotcha. So there's a lot of positives, we believe, for that. So All right, now you're again, cutting into ABC, your time. I am doing too much talking, not enough setting up, am I? <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. Well, what did I say, four minutes? Maybe I, maybe I should have a said sales guy, five. Though. Yeah, too much talking. Huh? A, B, C, and D. Okay. Yeah, so, but it's it's not a it's not a sprint. So again, reverse the process. Line up the T posts. I like to do a little tug just to make sure they're installed properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sockets are installed and now carefully, I think I dropped these one time during our training here, Scott. Uh, I recall Place, place the uh, devices ever so gently mm -hmm. on the tray and shut the lid. Okay. So what's the time? We're looking at, hold on, let's switch over to this camera over here and Three minutes. Three minutes. Right on the dot. Wow. Nice job. Amazing. Nice job. You think I did this every day. <laughs> okay, All right, so, so that's a job. That was a job changeover. Now, how and, about... And let me put this in context, yep. Scott. You know, we have most of our customers, they who are programming just in time. Right. They have several devices they'll program throughout the, the shift. Okay. Because they're providing parts, again, just in time to their manufacturing line. Mm -hmm. And so you can see there's almost no downtime. Now you do have to set up and teach the job the first time and Whisper Teach is a big part of that which we'll demo in a few minutes. Okay. But it, it really is easy to change over, very little downtime. So um, that's a big advantage for the BPM equipment. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is select the job that we've taught for the demo. Okay. Can so I turn I go, this just a smidge? Absolutely, you don't mind? There please we go. do. So auto handler, open workflow and webinar. So these job master files that we've created, again, it's a way to ensure quality and repeatability. Okay. Know, BP Win is one of the big reasons customers buy our products, ease of use and reliability and quality are built into BP Win. So right. again, having your uh, job master files set up and saved <clears throat> and what that, in fact, what you can do, you can, you can create your jobs remotely an engineer can set them up and the BP jobs can be sh saved and used wow. on this machine as well. Very cool. So I'm going to hit program. We're going to, because of time, we're only going to run 41 devices. Okay. Let me set up my other camera over here. So the machine goes through an initialization process. It's mm -hmm. confirming that the machine is set up based on the job master configuration, checking for sockets and it's downloading the firmware right. and then the job file as well. And off it goes and picks up the first device okay. and places it in socket site 1A. So we're gonna use a four second programming time for demo purposes. Right. And then it's gonna continue. So it passes the first device and it moves on to the job. So while the machine is operating, Scott, let's talk a little bit more about the 3901, some of the features and things. You know, fundamental to the technology is the ninth generation programming hardware. Right. You know, we uh, released the ninth generation in roughly 2017, and right out of the box, our universal platform can supports over 36,000 devices. Wow. And we're adding device support to that technology daily. Now, now how does so thirty six thousand devices just for ninth gen? How does that compare across the board with uh, our, say, uh, competitors? Well, 
You know, it's, it's difficult to judge exactly, but let's just say that some of the other competitors, they have multiple platforms, right? and their count is based on the sum of all of those platforms. So okay. we've heard legend of 75,000, but, but I believe it's not based on one particular platform. It's the, again, the summation of all their technologies. Okay. Just to put it in context here, in the US we have a primary competitor and we've been competing with those guys for 35 years. Mm -hmm. They have a product that they've been developing since the early 2000s and they couple that with their memory programmer. Right, so right. for us we have one programming site technology, ninth gen. For this competitor they have a combination of programming sites and so if you want the full gamut of support, you've got to buy two site sets. Gotcha. And my understanding, now I would, I would say the customer should check this number, but to my knowledge, this product that they have has less than 15,000 total device support wow. today. Wow, okay. So I, I think you're being we, generous we too. We compare but. favorably, I believe. And, and gotcha. you know, really the most important thing isn't necessarily what's in the box now, but can we support it in the future? Right. And Night Gen really does do the job in okay. the future. It's unlike anything else in the market today. Hey, Colin, I, I, I'm not hearing the machine running. What's going on? Okay, so we finished the job. Oh, nice. A couple of things we didn't talk about, but I'll, I'll point out. Yeah. You know, we also use a very high precision cyber optics on the fly vision alignment camera. Right, that's and, the that's the red light that I was yeah, seeing. Okay. Exactly. So it does a couple of things. Number one, when every time you pick a device, you need to make sure the device is aligned properly before it goes to its destination. Right. You know, bad things can happen if the device is misaligned and of course. pins can get damaged, that type of thing. Right, right. So with a cyber optics camera, this camera is so precise, we can align and place devices as small as an 0402 resistor. Now, that's a resistor, not a programmable, but the point is, if you have very small CSP devices, mm -hmm. we can program and handle those. Okay, in, in real terms, what, 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 what size is that? That's uh, one millimeter by half a millimeter. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. It is, very, very small. Even on this, even on this uh, smaller platform? Absolutely. Wow, okay. Uh, and, and again, this small platform is used in tier one automotive manufacturers globally. Okay. So, you know, this is not a entry level programmer. The only thing that makes it entry level is just really the capacity. And if you need more capacity, we can add that. And we'll talk about scalability a little bit more in the future. Sweet. So again, this machine, if I didn't say it earlier, eight sockets initially out of the box can be expanded up to four programming sites, 16 sockets. Okay. A little bit more about cyber optics though before we move on. All right. It can do the CSP devices. It can also do the higher end range QFPs. So up to a 35 by 35 millimeter device. Well. Wow. So universal technology, universal handling. Nice. We know you, and that's why CMs and OEMs like this product, <clears throat> they can count on it programming the, the next device as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, what's next? Let's, well, that's a good question. I, I have a feeling Whisper Teach may be next. Oh, Whisper Teach. That's right. We talk a lot about that. Yeah. So a little bit about Whisper Teach. Yeah. Give, the me, old, the, give me the big picture. What is okay. Whisper Teach? Well, let's let's start back a little bit more in history. All right. Historically, the teach process. Well, number one, it's fundamental to all pick and place handlers or in in our industry. You need to teach all the sockets, all the input outputs, and and even peripheral processes like laser marking. Okay. And X, X and Y, fairly state for, straightforward because of just modern pick and place machines. Very accurate as, as well. Yeah. But the Z has always been a tr uh, challenge because really it requires the operator to have a little bit of skill and knowledge. Okay, and the Z is the? Z is the up and down. Okay, up and keep down, it keep, it, yeah, keep it yeah, simple nozzle. for the marketing guy. So, the, uh, the Z height is what which Whisper Teach teaches is that, that height between the nozzle tip and the top of the device. So you can imagine, you teach it too low, you're potentially going to damage the, the device because you go through the device. Mm -hmm. If you teach it too high, you might have pick and place problems throughout the job, inconsistencies if right, you will. Right, right, right. Now, our cyber optics camera does overcome alignment issues, and that's the beauty of having the on-the-fly alignment camera. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you might have problems during the job if you have teach problems. Right. And you know, one thing about modern pick-and-place machines, they're very repeatable. 
So if you have a human that teaches the old-fashioned way and they teach it incorrectly, what do you think happens? Uh, you're going you're gonna to do the same thing over and over again. Exactly. So, yeah, gonna, that, could be, that could be very problematic. So especially if you have some kind of latent failure, maybe you're bending pins and you don't know it, or, in, or, or perhaps in a worst-case scenario there's a, a small die crack that could lead. You might get a green light at programming, and then what happens in the future because of this compromise, this latent failure, you might have the, the actual device, the, the widget, if you will, right. that's being manufactured that fails prematurely. So we took all the guesswork out mm -hmm. with WhisperTeach. Okay. Now that's a mouthful. I'm going to show the, the WhisperTeach process on the machine. It's going to happen like that. Yeah. But then I know you have a video you'll queue up and you can talk through that process as well again. I'm going to try. Uh, I guess the last thing I will say yeah. is that we, we talked about operators and their capability. Um, a human hair is about 50 microns in diameter. Okay, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about human hairs. Uh, it, a, the vision capability of a human being, typically the perception is about 40 microns. And that's, that's a young man, right? Young man, that's right. But, uh, you know, Whisper Teach can teach to within 15 microns accuracy. Wow. Crazy. So that tells you that it's really an accurate thing, and the most important thing is really operator independent. Okay. You can have your first shift guy do a great job and know everything out of the machine. The person on the second shift, maybe they're not quite as good. It doesn't matter. The machine doesn't care. Nice. Okay. okay. So we're taking the so we're taking the human element out. We are of it. taking the human element out. So what we're going to do? Can you see the screen? Okay, we can, here, Scott. We can. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say, okay, the job ended. I guess I should have done that earlier. It's going to give us a job summary. Mm -hmm. And what the job summary does, it gives you all the key statistics, the yield and, and DPH and that type of thing. And often customers use this to judge, uh, well, how efficient their process yeah. is. And that's generated every single time it runs? It is. Nice. And there's a log file that you can retrieve that information as well. All right, so we're going to go to auto handler and teach. Okay. And then what's happening, the machine is, is saying, or it recognizes I'm trying to teach, so it's going to look and see what it has installed. All right. And it's going to identify that. So in this case, we're going to teach programmer site one. Okay. And then it just walks you through the menu. So I select teach. And it's going to give me the option for uh, the sockets. All right. So for brevity's sake, I'm just going to teach 1A. And you know, Scott, the process is the same as far as whisper teach, whether you're teaching the job the first time or a job in this case we're verifying. Mm -hmm. It'll show you what happens with whisper teach. Okay. So I say next after selecting socket 1A. I do have to identify the pin one orientation okay. relative to the socket and the device. Say next. And now it's going to say, please ensure that there is a target device in the primary socket 1A. So this is one thing the operator does have to do with Whisper Teach. They have to provide a device in socket. Okay. So I'm so going to use we're, my... We're keeping, we're keeping somebody employed. That's we good. are. So simply place the device. I'm going to give you a minute to replace your camera so yeah. the folks watching remotely can see. Yeah, because it does happen pretty quick. It does. Tell me when you're ready. Uh, looking good. Paul's all set. All right, so I'm going to say next, and the machine takes over from that point. So you can see the nozzle goes down. It identifies the top of the device using this electro pneumatic circuit that we have in Whisper Teach. Wow, that's, and, and it's, it's done? It's done. Okay. Yeah. So you can imagine, that was what, eight seconds, roughly? If you uh, had eight sockets, it, it's going to be very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's now asking me to remove the device. Scott, i tell you what, I know you have a video that shows some of this in slow motion. Why don't you, why don't you take them through that yeah. while I uh, change the machine? Sounds great. I will do that. So Paul, Paul is uh, 
Paul's working behind the scenes, making sure that everything's running. So we've got we've got a video on our website. You know what is Whisper Teach? So it talks about again that that critical Z height, uh, and and that you know what you just saw happen so fast. We want to slow it down so you can actually see what is going on. So this is actual speed on our 4910. Uh, we're slowing it down. And this is actually running on a uh, on a CSP device, so one of those really really tiny. We've got a dime there. Uh, it's much much smaller than a dime. Uh, so what it's doing is it's coming down. It's making contact or very close to contact. Then it's going to re-verify that height, and then it's going to pick it, spin it, make sure that it's oriented correctly. You see that it made a slight adjustment to put it put it right on the center of the device, and again. Now it's taught. Uh, so what you're seeing here is, uh, uh, let me, can we stop that, Paul? Thank you, Paul. Uh, what we did a few years ago at one of our trade shows in, in Munich is that we actually did what we call the Whisper Teach Challenge. And what we did was we asked uh, people to come by our booth and to try to do a manual uh, teach. Uh, and Scott, using, if I could, yeah, yeah. And what you say, what you're saying, manual teach the old-fashioned way, yeah, the, the way old -fashioned most way. people, most customers have to do it on other machines, right? That's right. That's or right. even legacy BPM machines, but the the current models all have Whisper Teach. Yeah. And so what we did is we plotted a graph of, and this is the actual results as they came in, plotted a graph of all the people that that tried to do the Whisper Teach. Uh, let's pause it right there for a sec. You know, most people talk too high because most people, and it's understandable, are, are kind of skittish about driving that nozzle down into the, into the device, uh, and we can keep it going. If, if you teach it too high, it can cause misalignment errors. Our, our cyber optic camera kind of overcomes some of that stuff. But again, the teaching too low, that's really problematic because you can introduce latent uh, failures or failures, you know, just on, on, the, on, the, on the line. So, and again, comparison, that's a human hair that I know th nothing about. The unaided eye is 40 microns. Whisper teaches within 15 microns. So very, very close, very accurate, very repeatable. You know, Scott, we talked about uh, scalability earlier. Uh, one of the advantages that BPM has, you know, we manufacture the machines here in Houston. Our design team is upstairs, our manufacturing team downstairs. We're, right. kind, of, we're kind of in the middle. We are and in the uh, so, you know, one of the advantages of that is we can do a lot of things with our machines maybe that someone who outsources to another machine manufacturer cannot do. Okay. So this machine, the two sites, eight sockets, very productive, a million devices plus per year, I think very easily. Yeah. Multiple shifts, you can increase that. You need more socket capacity. We talked about upgrading to four programming sites, 16 sockets. Well, let me, let me pause you right okay. there. Yeah. Uh, we, if you have any questions, if you want to queue up the Q and A, if you if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, uh, Paul will be over here on the side answering those questions, or I'll we'll, we'll try to answer those questions uh, if you have any. But uh, continue. We were talking about uh, scalability, scalability, right. upgradability, right? Yeah. So this machine, thirty nine hundred one, can be shipped, but if the operator or if the customer has larger memory devices that come onto the scene because let's face it, contract manufacturers, even OEMs, don't really know long term what they're going to be programming. Sure. If they need more programming capacity, then this machine can be upgraded to a 3928 in the field. Oh wow. Okay. That's awesome. So it's that's the beauty okay, of controlling. So going going from yes. a, a 3901 to a 3928, what are we talking about in as far as uh, upgrading capacity? Great question. So well, thank you. the 3901, 1,088 devices per hour. Mm -hmm. A 3928, 1432 devices per hour maximum. Mm -hmm. But the key is 28 sockets. Wow. So again, it's all really relative to programming time. If you have short programming times, then getting a thousand devices per hour or such may be fine. Mm -hmm. But when you have uh, when you have large memories or long programming times, then of course the more sockets the better. And that can be fitted tape in, tape out, with up to 28 sockets on this machine. Incredible. Yeah. So huge scalability. Okay. And and upgradable in the field. Absolutely. Sweet. 
Yeah, the other thing is, you know, we talked about uh, ease of operation, ease of installation. This machine as it stands, it's, it's really capable of self-installation. You know, people buy 3D printers all the time. Right. This is really not that much more complicated. Now, we do have sales and support in 42 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And, but this COVID thing, it's a, it's a new world we're all living in, right, and policies right. have changed. So the cool thing is, uh, we were ship, we recently shipped a machine to Asia, and they have this lockdown period that's in effect. But they needed their machine. Right. So what we did is we set up the machine just like it's going to be run in the production facility. And so what we'll do is we will work remotely with the distributor and the customer and they'll install it. So we set up the jobs exactly how they're gonna run, and we can do the same thing for other customers. Nice. So ease of installation is a key. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, I, we, we had a couple of questions Well, come just in. La last thing about that, if yeah, I can. Yeah, you keep talking, I'm gonna is, come over here. Uh, we would expect this machine could be installed within three to five days. So within three to five days, we should be in full production mode. Okay. So we have some questions. Yeah, we had a, a we got a question from Murray. Uh, okay. Is the 1088 per hour using 16 sockets? That's a great question. Um, it, it can achieve, yes, it can achieve 1088 per hour using 16 sockets, but it depends on the configuration. There are a lot of variables. So the, the best thing is to get the devices, mm -hmm. you know, devices and volumes, and we can provide a capacity analysis, including the, uh, the DPH expectations. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. What else? And the, and the other question that we had was, uh, what is the programming time to get 1088? Well, again, there are a lot of variables as far as the uh, that that number. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I would have to go back, but I think that's that's a great question. You know, t I would say 10 seconds is probably a realistic number. Okay. Somewhere in that range. A lot of the small microcontrollers don't program don't take a lot of time to program right but back to my scenario of a million devices per year that was based on a 40 second programming time and with just two sites too, with right? two sites okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so i think that's more of a realistic context you know people talk about dph and we do too it's, it's because we all get measured by that but it's really a green light time and how many how many parts are actually coming out of the machine based on all the variables not just the max DPH. So there's a lot more to throughput than just DPH. Yeah, the workflow configuration, the peripherals that are being used, absolutely. Okay. Number of sockets. Okay, uh, we've got uh, one more question. Uh, how do I know which machine I need? So, for, you know, for instance, uh, we, we sell manual mm. systems and we also sell three different flavors of, of uh, these automated programmers. Yeah. We got the small footprint over here. Mm -hmm. uh, over here, off camera, is our 4910. So how, do, uh, how would a customer know which machine they should get? Yeah, well, look, we, it's always great to start with a conversation, but the, the bottom line is the data we need are the devices and the volumes. Okay. But we also want to have the conversation because everybody's needs are different. Their future requirements might look different than what they need today. And there might be some things we can share with customers that, uh, that they don't know already about device programming. So we, we welcome conversation and then we fit the requirement um, with the right machine. Okay. Uh, and I guess it, it's also helpful that uh, we, we have local support, right? Yeah, we have factory trained uh, service engineers around the world and uh, distributors that are very mature, have been with BPM, some of them for 10, 15, 20 years or more. So, you know, definitely the folks in the field, they're an extension of BPM. We count on them and they're experts just like we are. Okay, got a couple of more questions okay. in. Let's do uh, this one. Are the sockets the same type that I would use on my 2800? model programmer. So that's a that's a uh, an eighth gen manual programmer. Yeah, well, so by and large, the answer is yes. There might be some nuances to that. Uh, the, the actual physical burn-in test socket is absolutely going to be common. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a few, perhaps, that weren't developed with ninth gen in, in mind, but, but by and large, 
Yes. But the, I guess the, the, the bigger question is on, let's say it's, let's, let's simplify it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. On the ninth gen, let's say I have a, I have a socket and a device that I, I use on my manual programmer mm -hmm. and, I, and, and my volumes come up and I want to move into a automated system. Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to be compatible? Absolutely. The that, socket, that one 100%, So right? if you buy a 2900 today and you need a 3900 later or 39 Oh one, mm -hmm. then absolutely, it's the same socket card. Okay, sweet. Yep. Uh, we are running out of time, but we might have time for one more. Ooh, here's a tough one. Here's a tough one. I don't know if if, if Colin can answer this one. This oh, one's no. going to get extra credit. <laughs> what is the cycle time for flashing a one gig file in NAND flash? Yeah. Go. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> know. We would need a device, and we would be happy to run a benchmark. Right. And then. If, if they're really interested in automation, we can run a real benchmark on this machine or a 3928 or a 4910 mm -hmm. and show them what the real DPH is going to be. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, look, we, we want to take the mystery out of programming. We want to make it easy and information is, is really part of that process. So whatever we can do to demystify device programming that's our job. So we're, we're trying to make device programming simple, easy, and cost effective. Right. At that, least that's, 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 uh, my, that's my three that's marketing. That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty, three <laughs> things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, we, are, we are running on to uh, 30 minutes, and we really want to respect your time. We sure appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, we, had, we had quite a few folks show up today, so that's great. Yeah, thank uh, you. So lots of interest in the 3901. And again, we're, we're, we're planning on doing more of these in the future. Uh, if you can contact me, I'm, I'm going to be sending out uh, links to this video so that people that weren't able to come would be able to see it. Uh, you can also send me suggestions on different things that you'd like to see. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try to We'll try to make those happen. Yeah, I think of things like actually teaching the workflow and, okay. and uh, those type of things to really dig into the detail of right. the capability of the machine. Yeah. And the nice thing about this venue is that we can show more detail than we would normally at a trade show. Right, right. And share that. Okay. Okay, Scott, good seeing you, man. COVID appropriate uh, handshake there. Uh, we sure appreciate you guys coming out. Thanks, uh, everybody. Thanks for coming. Cool.